Fireside Chat series. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Lee Cedric. I have a dual appointment here in the law school and over at Science and Society. And just to set the stage um, a little bit for what we're doing, um, responsible data and emerging technologies has really become a critical issue for society and, and globally. Um, as we read in the popular press and we read um, across the board, you know, AI, data, emerging technology have so much potential to do so many benefits for society, helping combat climate change, helping with the economy, helping uh, achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But if we don't use them responsibly, we can also have a lot of harms, right? Um, violating civil rights, safety issues. So the grand challenge for society is how can we harness the power of this technology and of data responsibly so we can reap all those benefits and mitigate the risks. And that's what um, our fireside chats are going to explore. My classes explore that. And there's a whole host of offerings um, at Duke addressing these issues. So to kick off our fireside chats today, I am really thrilled to introduce uh, my friend Carl Hahn, who is the Chief Compliance Officer at Northrop Grumman. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the defense industry, Northrop Grumman is one of the leaders in aerospace and defense um, that produces really important products that are critical to our national security. And as the Chief Compliance Officer at Northrop Grumman, um, Carl runs a whole organization that's responsible for making sure that the company um, is aware of the existing laws, setting up programs um, for compliance, and cuts across um, really all different, different types of sectors. And um, also, just before we jump into the program, I just want to uh, let everyone know that we're recording this program, so people who couldn't be here can use it. We're going to open it up. I'll ask Carl some questions, and we can ask um, for, for Q&A. So Carl, I wanted to begin, um, and welcome to Duke, with um, you know, aerospace and defense. Um, a lot of people don't think about that um, in terms of artificial intelligence. Um, so what, what, what do you do? What does Mark do with respect to AI? Um, that, that's a great question, Lee, but first of all, I'm, I'm just delighted to be here and uh, able to spend some time with you all to discuss this important, this important topic. It's, it's a privilege. Um, Professor Peter is a real leader and responsible and ethical of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and it's a burgeoning area that I've been focusing on probably for the last two plus years um, as we emerged out of the pandemic. Um, to, to go to your question, Lee, um, what does the defense industry do with artificial intelligence? I mean, it is fundamental to the future of national and global security. Uh, we need to look no farther than Eastern Europe and what's happening in a real war zone in Ukraine. And there are numerous um, examples of active use of artificial intelligence, drones, autonomous craft, crowdsourced um, intelligence gathering, et cetera. And a lot of this is just using existing commercial technology, not even just both. So how to make decisions better, smarter, faster, more accurately, more predictably, is very much central to how, how our customer set is looking at these really important questions. I mean, when we look at what we do as Northrop Grumman, um, you know, we, we, we basically have products and services that go all the way from the bottom of the sea floor to a million miles out from, from Earth in the James Webb Space Telescope and everything in between. So that is the entire chain of command in a, in a, in a domain or a theater as that's as discussed in the defense industry and through that, you're making decisions, right? You're collecting information, you're assessing information, you're trying to predict what's going to happen with that information, you're transmitting that to a platform, whether it's a radar, whether it's an aircraft, whether it's a submarine, whether it's a spacecraft, you are then using that to make decisions in all kinds of different areas. And it's not just things in the battlefield, it's also logistics and personnel issues and all the things that many companies deal with. So, I would say artificial intelligence is fundamental to what our customers are doing right now, and how to do that in a way that complies with the law of war, with the ethics and values of the department, which we can talk more about the AI ethics principles that they've come out with, not only the Department of Defense, but also the intelligence community. And from my standpoint, from where I sit, this is an existential issue. This really is something that's going to be important for um, justifying confidence from the policymakers in Congress to appropriate the funds, from the public who I think demands appropriately responsibility and accountability in how we're doing it, and frankly, to the military personnel who deserve to use products and solutions that they can rely on and trust. So that whole interface of that group with AI has been incredibly fascinating. 
Um, and I'm, I'm privileged to actually be able to dive into these issues, and I'm grateful that the company supports it. Yeah. That, that's a great, a great answer, and I think just kind of picking up on what you said and sort of looking at it from a legal policy perspective, um, you know, everything Carl said has been um, reinforced by leaders in our country about a year and a half ago. We had the National Security Commission on AI that came out with a report that was a real um, eye-opening for a lot of people that basically said, you know, having AI capitalizing on the use of data is a national security issue. And given the threats, and this was before we had the war in the Ukraine, this is given what China's doing, um, it's imperative to our national security, to our competitiveness, um, to be able to, to really advance in, in these areas. Um, maybe you could also, sort of picking up on that point, talk a little bit about the role of data. Um, you know, some people in the class here may understand how artificial intelligence works, but like, what's the nexus between data, national security, and, and AI? So I think the data, you could call it the data issue, the, the data challenge, the data problem, um, and I, we, we can almost have a philosophical discussion about how to characterize data. I've heard data described as the new oil, right? A rush for an asset that has tremendous value that you, that you, you know, you basically collect and, and, and market and monetize. Um, data is the new air. It's like everywhere, the air is everywhere. Or I've heard data described as the new asbestos, right? Um, that's the other side of the equation. Um, I don't know where to land on this. What I do know, and I've emphasized this um, in my role as chief compliance officer, I've been very involved in the digital transformation efforts of our companies. A lot of major firms have been going through digital transformation. Um, it seemed to really accelerate during the pandemic. And to me, why am I involved, right? Because that's you would think, a lot of tech solutions. Well, it has a lot to do with how we are managing risk and how we are doing them um, in, a, in an effective, nimble, and agile way, which in a marketplace will frankly give you a competitive advantage and also allow you to deliver the best value to your customers and also deliver you know, to your rest of your stakeholders. Fundamental to any digital transformation case, in, in, and it's really just accelerated with artificial intelligence is your data set. And you know, in the beginning, um, you just did these, I don't know, blank looks is the right word, but it, it was it was really, it's like, so where's, where is the data? Where did it come from? Who owns the data? What is the provenance of the data? How are we gonna test the quality of this data? Because that's what's driving your outputs. The algorithm, as many of you, if any of you have the tech background, is you know, it's math running against, it's code running against data producing an output. If the data is flawed, your output is flawed. If your data is improperly biased, we can talk a little bit about the bias question, um, then that's going to create unintended consequences. So I think data governance, data discipline, and dealing with some, a lot of unanswered questions around data is fundamental. It's been interesting in some respects. I mean, it's not like algorithms are easy, but in some respects they're easier to grasp than the big data issue. Yeah. I mean, I think the data issue is um, a real challenge, and just for people in the audience who may not be familiar with AI, I mean, the typical model is machine learning. So you have an algorithm, and instead of it learning from hard-coded rules, it learns from data sets. So if you don't understand what's in your data, or if your data has bias in it, um, it's going to impact the quality of the output. And what Carl was saying, there's this whole emerging field around data governance. How do we understand? What our data quality is, and it's kind of the same way to our next question. I can, I can, I can okay, comment on that just a little bit. I mean, because when I sometimes when you talk to people and you're trying to say, what, you know, I'm really focused on artificial intelligence and responsible artificial intelligence, like, well, well, Carl, isn't it just software? I mean, is it really that special? And I'll, I'll and, and this this comes from the policymaker space too, where they're used to like, I'll go buy a software product, I'll license it, I'll load it on my client device and I will run it, and you will send me updates when there's bugs, I'll tell you there's a bug, and you will fix that. AI teaches itself, we know this, right? We know this. This is, the, this is a major difference, is that AI will train on a data set and come up with a different result. It learns, learning in quotes, but it still changes, and the outputs change. How do you deal with that from a contraction perspective? How do you deal with that from a quality and safety perspective? And that is definitely a wrinkle um, that I think puts it in the in some category. I think this conversation is also kind of a good segue to another, I think, really important topic. I mean, both Carl and I are trained as lawyers, and I, I am a Pratt, Pratt graduate, so I do have an engineering background from a long time ago, but I, I worked as a lawyer. And 
you know, as you listen to this conversation, it's really important for lawyers to understand how the technology works and for um, technologists to have some idea of where the law is going so they can then build that into design. And I think one of the challenges industry faces is creating those multidisciplinary teams. That's something that we work on and teaching at Duke through the Ethical Tech Practicum. But you know, Northrop has been a real leader in trying to build these multidisciplinary teams in this forefront. So maybe you can share with us some of your secrets of success and how you've, you've done this to get the engineers and the lawyers to be able to communicate effectively. Um, yeah, what we, what we did early on um, is, and I have to confess, I went to the University of Virginia, so I'm not going to bet against it. Um, and, um, but um, one of the things we did early on was pull, we had an artificial intelligence campaign, which was one of our primary sort of business, business initiatives in terms of the technology we're developing, not only to support our customers, but we're actually doing quite a bit internally um, with respect to these solutions. And it was clear to me and many others that you cannot grapple with the 360 range of issues if it's just an IT problem. It is not just an IT problem. You can't just flip this to the chief information officer organization or your IT team and say, go code algorithms and go roll stuff out and let's hope for the best, right? That's, that's not gonna work. Um, there's just too many complexities. So what we did is pull together a cross-functional team on day one and that's, that's you know, um, attorneys, that's compliance folks like myself really introducing how, how are we going to manage risk? How are we going to hold true to our values? How are we going to do the right thing? <coughs> what, about, what about internal policies, procedures, and processes, right? These things actually matter. Um, and you have to deal with the culture that you have in your own company. They matter a lot in an engineering company. Engineers are all about, show me the requirement. You know, if you show me a mandatory requirement, I will go execute against the mandatory requirement. So we, we have to go through that process. We have communications on our, on our, on our team, how we look at our external relationship. We have government relations to deal with how we're addressing the policy makers, whether on the Hill and other governments overseas. So this, this multidisciplinary group, I think, has been absolutely fundamental to us looking at the problem for yeah. No, really, I mean, with these types of problems, issues, it really does take a village of bringing together all the different types of expertise and to make a little bit of a plug in the ethical tech practicum, that's what we do and we are so thrilled to have Carl and his colleagues at Northrop participating in the practicum um, this upcoming semester. So they'll be working with a group of Duke students across different disciplines to solve um, a real world problem that Northrop Grumman is. is I expect them to solve the data governance. <laughs> in 10 weeks. <laughs> we're working on it. We're, we're working on it. Um, so kind of sort of picking up on that theme as a lawyer, like I'm a lawyer, uh, sometimes it can be hard to um, figure out you know, how to communicate effectively with the engineers and sometimes the technical knowledge that the engineers have to be a little daunting, but any strategies or tips um, from the legal side or the compliance side in terms of how to bridge that, that gap so they can have effective communications? Hmm. That's, you know, um, so I just spend a lot of time with our, with our digital teams and our, and our data team. And I think it's a great opportunity to, to educate yourself and just learn something new and stretch your skills and, and get into some areas outside your comfort zone. Um, you, know, it, you know, our folks are incredibly generous with their time. They have no problem demonstrating their tools, they have no problem taking me through the actual process of software development, no problem having me on you know, boards like Confluence and Jira and all our tools in the development environment. Um, but you know, fundamentally, and you know, having somebody come in and you know, can you really explain to me what a neural network is, please? Can you actually explain to me and how we can keep around and get inside the black box and understand the outputs? But it is a constant conversation because they're always going to be let deeper on the nuts and bolts of the architecture and the fine refinements of the map. On the other side, the lawyers are going to be much more attuned to contracts, indemnities, insurance issues, liabilities, IP issues, all these other things. So you really need your subject matter experts to do what they're best at, and then you gotta pull it up at a level that you can make, make decisions. Um, we just stood up, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we just stood up an information governance board to intentionally um, deal with these issues of data. Again, it's cross-disciplinary, and cross-functional, and we, we spend a, a whole lot of time having, having these conversations. Um, it's, it's a brave new world, right? And I think there's a good lesson in there, many good lessons in there, but one I wanna, I wanna emphasize for students is 
you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, having practiced law for 30 years, you know, clients would come to you, come to me with all different types of technologies. And, you know, it's okay not to necessarily understand everything at the outset, but it's your obligation to understand enough to be able to do your job. So asking questions of people, in my experience, are always super enthusiastic to talk about what they do. I mean, is that your experience too? Like yeah. having those conversations yeah. is easy. Mm -hmm. um, so then sort of shifting, so the lawyers, the compliance, the ethicists need to be talking to the technologists to understand what the basic technology is, because it's hard to structure compliance around something if you don't fundamentally understand what it is. But there's also, I think, a lot that the technologists can learn from the legal field. Um, I mean, I think to put it succinctly, the legal and policy landscape is the Wild West out there, and it seems like every day there's a new headline on some new legal development that's really relevant um, to your business. So as, as the chief compliance officer who's responsible for making sure that Northrop complies with all of this, what do you do? How, what are some strategies for communicating with the engineers to make sure that they understand it and, and it gets pushed down to, to the front line? Well, yeah, this is an issue to lose sleep over for sure. Um, <laughs> we're trying to deal with the risk of this um, of the significance. And I think you're right, Lee. I think we, we, we anticipated or we perceived early on that the technology is accelerating at a backward bending curve. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have been playing around with ChatGPT and generative AI. I mean, it's just like every single day there's some new capability that is really quite remarkable. Uh, I asked ChatGPT to write a document retention procedure, which is hardly like the, you know, something that I would think is all that interesting, and it came up with a pretty good draft. I was like, thanks, ChatGPT. And he, so, what are we going to do, right? And this is where companies like us are really looking to create an urgency and a demand signal to, you know, researchers and thought leaders like yourself, the policy makers, think tanks, what have you, governments to start thinking hard about how we are going to create frameworks and guidelines. And we see this with our customers, right? So there's, there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, but, you know, we're still in a zone where policy and law are trying to catch up with a technology that is simply just speeding along. And we're trying to adapt as a society, we're trying to adapt as a country, we're trying to adapt to our customers to meet their needs, and it's just, it's, it's incredibly interesting, but it's also quite challenging. Where I would say we are right now is we're kind of in the adjectives phase. There's lots of adjectives, right? You know, AI has to be responsible, traceable, explainable, governable, reliable, right? Lots of adjectives everywhere. There are so many different sets of principles and white papers, et cetera. How do we turn adjectives into action? How do we turn them into operations? So that's, that's very much a big part of my job. The chief compliance officer, he just sits around and has slogans and, and just sort of you know, corporate, corporate messaging isn't impacting behavior, isn't actually changing how the, op the, the business operates. Um, and this is across the board in compliance issues. So, but this issue in particular, so, so how do we get to the point where there's somebody sitting in a room like this who's holding an algorithm who's actually going to be engaging with what is responsible and ethical artificial intelligence at the time he's doing it, using a data set that's already been scrubbed and qualified and certified, if that's the right word, for that purpose, right? And I think that's where, we're, that's where we need to head. Um, there are days where I'm like, we can't do it all by ourselves. Um, we, we're not gonna have all the data. We're gonna have to get the data from different people. We're not gonna be able to write all the algorithms. Some of the algorithms are gonna come from third parties. Some of them are gonna be in our, in our vendors' um, solutions already. And our, you know, what have they done to ensure that they're acting in a responsible way? So I would say this is really fluid right now, and, 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 and you know, but it's urgent because I, I think the developments are so quick. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, I, I agree with you. I think it really is urgent. Um, and if you read what the, again the National Security Commission on AI has said, the Department of Defense has implemented a whole AI strategy, and they have ethics and principles. And I think one of the challenges is like even at the governmental level is taking some of these policies and good intentions. And this is where, like even in the policy space, the lawyers and the engineers need to work together because we don't have standards. Um, like cybersecurity, we have standards. You can certify that you're ISO compliant. You know, how do you certify that your algorithm is 95% accurate? 
And I mean, how important do you, so NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States, is part of the Commerce Department, is working on an AI risk management framework. You've got standards organizations around the globe that are working on standards. From a policy perspective, how important do you think it is for the um, technologists to come up with standards to support the laws so it gives it more meaning? I think it's critically important, um, and I think we're, we, we need to look to groups like NIST and others to really help help us define that. We would like to be part of that conversation. Um, I would still say that there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. I mean, oftentimes you'll start a, a session like this, even with engineers and technologists, and you'll ask them, so what's generative AI, and you'll get four or five different answers. What's narrow AI? What's general artificial intelligence? You know, we're not using the same terms in exactly the same way. That's so you spend the first 15 minutes just trying to deal with terms and definitions. And that's even with experts, right? So that is that is that is something that does need to shift. And there's areas where we don't have standards. Like what is, what is a, you know, how are you going to look at data sets? How are you going to assess data sets? Now, the EU, who I know we spend a lot of time with the European Union, has this upcoming AI Act. And for those of you who aren't familiar, they're going to be, the idea is you're going to chunk um, AI solutions into, into you know, um, low risk, medium risk, and high risk solutions. And for the high risk solutions, you've got to do this conformity testing. Well, that's that's a great word, conformity testing. It's another couple of sort of adjective type words. And then I ask questions like, so how does that work exactly? Like, we don't know. And then there are like 3,000 different amendments to that. So we need, I mean, I hate to say this, we just need to do something. Yeah. Um, but maybe you have some ideas of what we need to do. Well, I, I think, again, that's kind of the thought behind the ethical tech practicum and some of the work that we're trying to do at LIDA at Duke is bringing together the lawyers and the technologists with the engineers because no single group is going to have the answers and it's all about working together of, of trying to get the like um, thinking about as you were talk, talking about those those issues with the EUAI Act which we could get into but even here in the United States and we're going to talk about this more next week in our fireside chat with EEOC Commissioner Sonderling, but New York City um, enacted an AI audit um, ordinance that basically if you're using AI in connection with um, hiring, you need to do an audit, which in theory is fine, right, if anybody knew what an AI audit was. So well, you're laughing, but these are the types of issues that we're struggling with, and it's a question of finding the solutions so the laws can actually have um, You need more a standard meaning. for an audit. Yeah, exactly. Right? And I work a lot with our internal auditing team. The first question is, what's the standard? They're usually looking at our internal process procedure or SOX, or you know, uh, general accounting principles or well-established standards. So that's, well, that's, that's relatively straightforward. This is, this is. So the great news for students is there's a lot of work to be done in this area, so great career opportunities, and these are really hard problems. Um, I don't know about you, but like, I don't think ChatGPT is going to be solving these issues for us. It's going to take a lot of it's smart just plain giving legal advice. <laughs> Try and ask you a legal question to give you this way. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up for questions in a minute, but you've touched upon a couple times the um, information mm -hmm. governance program, because we've talked about the data issue. because. Fundamentally, if the AI algorithms are not trained on reliable data, then the outputs are not going to be good, right? Like if you go to school and they teach you the wrong things, you're not going to graduate from school really understanding the subject matter. So getting that data right to train the algorithms is really important, and it comes back to the issue that we don't have widely accepted data governance standards. So everyone kind of does their own thing, um, we're working towards it. As when I say we, I mean society. So what is Northrop doing to try to tackle that issue? Yeah, I mean, so that's that's a big question for us. I mean, we're a you know thirty you know thirty plus billion dollar company with almost hundred thousand employees, and we have a lot of data, and we have a lot of data internally, and then we interface with with a lot of data. And I was a partisan from day one of our digital transformation efforts. I'm like, we just got to get our arms around the data challenge. And so what we've done is we've established a chief data officer. We've named the chief data officer. We have a chief data office that has primary organizational responsibility over data issues. And then we've created an information governance board where we develop cases in specific questions around data usage. We have a multidisciplinary, multifunction group of subject matter experts that assess that. We come, we have a, we have a conversation, and we make a determination on what to do. And it's a wide range of issues. 
and how we are going to use you know AI and machine learning models um, within the business is, is, is part of the purview of, of what we're talking about. Um, what we're finding very quickly is that these, these issues are really complicated, and sometimes you can't you can't you know the, the, the expectation was you're going to turn it around in two weeks, and all the lawyers are like no way. You know, a lot more time we grapple with some of these issues, or the technologists, there's technology issues, there's architecture issues. So it, I think it's going to be an incredibly important and valuable learning process for us as a company, and, and we'll ultimately wind up in a much better place. Yes, yeah, so just a quick show of hands. Um, when you came to this session today, how many of you thought you were going to hear the chief compliance officer of um, a major aerospace and defense company talk about the importance of data? How many of you thought that was going to be top of mind for him? Oh, good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> And it, you know, I think one of the things too is that, um, that that this underscores is that these issues around data, AI, and emerging technology. Yes, big tech, as we tend to think about it, is very concerned about these. But these issues cut across um, every sector of the economy. It's aerospace and defense. My class yesterday in the data governance uh, read an article from the Harvard Business Review. And um, it said something to the effect that 77%, uh, I don't know if it was written a year or two ago, of um, executives at companies were thinking about these issues. So you know they're top of mind really for every organization, not just not just big tech. But you know you were talking about the data governance um, infrastructure that you have at Northrop. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what government is doing because what you described sounds very similar to what we're seeing the Department of Defense do. So yeah, so our you know our principal customer is the U.S. Uh, defense community, both DoD and and the intelligence community. Um, where I think I think DoD um, was a leader early on. I mean, in 2018, they uh, you know there was the uh, creation of the Defense Innovation Board, um, chaired by Eric Schmidt, formerly uh, chairman of Google, and many prominent academics from from institutions you all would know. And one of the work streams of that Defense Innovation Board was artificial intelligence. And that's where they came up with the five DOD principles of, of reliable, traceable, equitable, um, and, and governable, um, and, and explainable artificial intelligence. And that those five principles were officially adopted by the department in February of, of 20. Um, since then, we've seen the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense come out just this summer with an implementation pathway, which I think took the next level because those early earlier documents were much more aspirational in nature, which they should be. I mean, principles, values, they matter. They matter because they tell people, here's the goal. Here's the overarching umbrella of what you should be trying to do. And then we need to talk about how we operationalize that, and that's what the pathway was getting at. And this document applied to all DOD components, which in our world is really important. That's the entire department, that's all services, nobody gets to opt out. And, and, and embedded with that, and it was pivoting a little bit off the National Commission for Artificial Intelligence, um, there was a mention in that report about acquisition, right, and procuring AI, but they didn't say much. If you go to the pathway, um, the, the demand signal now from the customer said it's pretty clear, is that when the department goes out and acquires artificial intelligence, the ethical principles need to be embedded in those requirements, because that means contractors have to deliver. And from our perspective, we want to be the ones that say, we're not only going to deliver, we're going to deliver what we promised, we're going to do the right thing, and we're going to do it to the absolute best of our ability. Um, this is an area where we think um, that you, you, need to, you need to have exceptional performance, not passing grade performance necessarily. And that's our goal. I think just picking up on a couple threads here, that great threads here that Carl said, um, you know, when he talks about procurement um, for us lawyers, what that means is government contracting. You know, what is the process for selling goods and services to the federal government? And it, it just goes to show that like AI and data really changes a whole host of areas of, of law that, um, you know, it's, it's I mean, how, from your perspective, like how is it changing government contracting? Well, it needs to change government yeah. contracting. Um, government contracting is particularly resistant to change. Um, the federal acquisition regulation still has, you know, basically uh, vibrations of the 1990s approach to software acquisition. So it's a real, it's, it gets identified over and over again as a challenge. Now, there are other ways for the government to acquire capability um, that are more common now, you know, for government contracts, geeks, it's other transaction authority or fast prototyping. 
Uh, but there's work that needs to be done in adapting the procurement system to deal with the unique, when unique or the, the particular characteristics of artificial intelligence, right? So that is going to be how do we how do we establish requirements and ask the hard questions that need to be asked about data? How do we deal with data rights and IP issues around artificial intelligence, particularly when it's creating its own outputs? And what are those outputs? I mean, I read recently, Lee, that somebody was trying to patent in Australia the, out, the invention of the AI. The yeah. AI made an invention, we want to patent. Yeah, the devil's um, Yeah, you know about this. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know enough time to get into it. I'm like, okay. Um, and then there's the liability and risk issues, right? So who's responsible for what? Because inevitably, there will be um, unintended consequences in AI. I mean, CSET out of, out of Georgetown called it AI accidents, right? These things happen to you. There's lots of articles in the media about Teslas doing things they weren't designed to do. Right, so what happens then? Who's responsible? And we see different regimes coming up, whether it's the EU or the UK and Scottish Law Commission came out with a proposal that was really quite interesting in how you're shifting, you're gonna shift risk around potential actors. Um, these are enormous issues. Yeah. And I think what you're highlighting is that to solve, <coughs> we talked about before, that to solve the AI challenges, you need to bring together people from lots of different disciplines. You need the engineers, you need the ethicists, you need policy people, lawyers. Um, but then even within practicing law, you know, Carl comes from industry, I came from big law. It, it takes a village, like I was not a government contracts lawyer um, when I was in practice. I did uh, commercial agreements and, and I led the AI practice. But as soon as the DOD started to introduce the AI ethics principles, all of a sudden my government contracts colleagues were calling me and saying, what does this mean? Um, so I think even for those of you who are gonna practice law, you need to kind of work across different disciplines with your colleagues in the firm or within the company because um, the issues keep popping up. One last question for me, then we're gonna, I promise we're gonna open it up. But, and what you touched upon a really important thread um, with coming up with the common definitions and standards and the OECD, the, um, which is a big multilateral organization, is trying to work on that issue. You talked about the Defense Innovation Board, um, which again, like the OECD, brings together a lot of different stakeholders, but how important is it to solve some of these issues to bring together different constituencies within society? Uh, I think it's vital. And I think if we looked at other big, hard problems, whether it's privacy or cybersecurity, um, we should we should we should reflect on the lessons learned from those multi-year, highly complex, quite quite difficult um, efforts. And I think they're most successful when you have very strong and robust partnership between the stakeholders. And, and from where, from where I sit, that's industry government interaction. Um, you know. The Davos conference is going on this week, and that was a, that's actually one of the major themes as to how to improve this, this this communication between stakeholders. From where I sit, I mean, I, I deal with regulation and requirements every single day, and you know, it's it's never it's it's difficult when you get a regulatory requirement and you support the goal 100 percent, whether it's a national security goal, a public policy goal, what have you, but you know full well. That the way it's being that you're being asked to do it is going to be burdensome, complex, and may in fact undermine the goal, actually make it harder to achieve the goal. And I ask myself, why didn't we have this conversation before this rolled out? You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna you know bite your head off, or or at least in our in our space, we really want to be cooperative and collaborative. The, those conversations are incredibly important. To and that's, I mean, I see it from my vantage point too that um, these multi-stakeholder convenings are really important to bring people together and then also the harmonization across different jurisdictions. So like for example, you know, the US and the EU, and, and you've alluded to this, are united on the same values, the OECD AI principles of, of trust and privacy. Um, when it comes to regulatory pathways, they really diverge and you know, trying to bring stakeholders together, respecting differences, but finding enough commonality that we can have cross-border flow and efficient um, sharing is, is really key, and it's one of the one of the big challenges. So we've talked a lot, and I'm sure all of you have questions. So I'm happy to open it up. Um, and every question is a good question. So who, who wants to go first? Nathan. Uh, yeah, I. Be curious to hear your thoughts on the role that um, increasing explainability technologies might play in the data governance 
um, demands in this industry, but also more specifically, I'd be curious to hear from your perspective as a chief compliance officer, how things like uh, corporate due diligence or investigations have been impacted by having to navigate around the seeming black box that might be sitting in the middle of um, you know, a necessary line of an investigation into any kind of conduct or, or a due diligence effort. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and this whole idea of how one deals with the current digital environment in terms of data retention, document preservation, investigations is very active. Um, you all may be uh, familiar with the least recent memo from the Deputy Attorney General, Lisa Monaco, which dealt with ephemeral messaging. That's not even AI. That's just chat, right? It's signal, WhatsApp, what have you. Um, and the issues of people doing things on their personal devices. Um, yeah, I think that's just, uh, frankly, I think that's still evolving. I mean, from my perspective, what I want to do, and, and it's, it's a priority for us, is to have a very, you know, a, a modernized, you know, of the moment, consistent with current digital environment, data retention, preservation, and management framework that can be defended in a, in a piece of litigation. <clears throat> what are the standards? I don't, I don't think anybody can tell me that. And this is where, you know, this is where, as a chief compliance officer, I'm constantly asking stakeholders, outside counsel, government, um, thought leaders like Lee, we need, we need some help here because a lack of certainty really creates a lot of friction. Um, it can actually impede innovation. It can actually have a del deleterious effect. Um, and when you're doing investigations, you know, we are searching for truth. I mean, our internal investigation team, our primary motivator is we need to establish confidence and our employee workforce that we are going to look at this, this allegation objectively, we are going to investigate it thoroughly, and we will, and we do, take action in response to that. That means we need to be get, we need to have access to the relevant information. Great question. So who wants to go next? Uh, a question regarding the, some companies, and I'm going to have your opinion on this, some companies in this field, what they actually do is some ethics washing you know that um, they try to sell the idea to the public that they have the same principle, yeah, ethical principles in place to prevent harms, etc. But if you go if you go inside of the company, you actually see that if the company is faced with a decision that puts in conflict the business interest with the ethical interest, they will always take the business interest um, way. So I just wanted to, to know your opinion. Yeah, that's another really great question. Um, and it's one that I think um, you hear discussed frequently in, in our compliance community. It's one that the regulators, frankly, are focused on. Um, so I guess I'll take it in in, in two steps. Um, you know, I would say I would say for Northrop Grumman and for any of you budding technologists and others who are looking for work. I mean, I think it's very much fundamental to us. I mean, and I really mean this. I mean, our our senior leadership team established our four principal values of doing the right thing of delivering what we've promised, of committing to shared success and pioneering. And we talk about that and we mean it. Why? Because that's what has to shape behavior. And as a chief compliance officer, I'm laser focused on driving those values, turning them into policies and procedures, and making that part of every, everybody's day-to-day -day work. So it's operationalized and the expectations are clear, right? Now, when you know 100,000 people, you're the size of a small city. Stuff is gonna happen. Not everybody's gonna behave themselves. Some of them, frankly, are just bad actors and you need to deal with that in course. Um, but when you start getting disconnects between what you say is values and what you're doing in actuality, that creates just a lot of risk. And I would call it unbounded risk. In fact, as I'm going to be doing, we'll be thinking hard about analytics actually to, 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 to point out where you have those pockets of toxicity so that you can go deal with them as a management team because I think that's, that's really important. To me, that's, that's, um, that's, that is not the sign of a healthy business, and I don't think healthy businesses succeed Long term in the marketplace. If you look at all, the, if you look at the name brand firms who've had trouble over the last several years, and you want to go have a business conversation, just look at their returns over the last five years versus their peers. They lag. Why did they lag? Because they had these massive internal issues, and it wasn't. And it was the values issues, it was the reputation issues, but also the massive disruption to the executive team who couldn't focus on the core business. So, I mean, I think there's really good, strong, lots of reasons to do this now. There will be issues where there are disparities. And regulators, I think, have been very clear with us that they're going to sniff that out. So if they're going to have an enforcement action against firm A, and firm A comes in with this beautiful code of conduct, 
with its simply produced training videos, with its nice set of values, and says that we do all these things, but then they have whistleblowers who say that isn't what happened. And they have um, other indicia or other evidence that there's a disconnect between what they say they're doing and what's really happening. That's the so-called paper program. That's a, that's a program that's not effective. So we talk a lot about what is effectiveness. Now, this is actually surprisingly hard to measure. So hopefully some of this tech, and I mean, AI, we've talked a lot about sort of the, the dark side of AI in some respects, but the upside is the ability to use this wonderful technology to be better at predicting issues, more responsive, and more effective at, at managing risk. Um, and I think we'll get better at trying to identify where the disparities are between, between you know, firms who say they're doing something where they're not really. But it's, it's a challenge. And even in your um, area of compliance more broadly outside of data and AI, um, you know, dealing with those substantive issues, but they, they have become tools to measure compliance within your organization that have helped with, with your compliance, trying to make sure that people aren't um, engaging in fraudulent transactions. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about how AI and data have improved, have made your job easier as, as a chief compliance officer. I mean, it's interesting. We, we, you know, you almost can take it in slices, right? I mean, because I think sometimes you want to go like right away to the most sophisticated bot or the, or the, um, or the, uh, you know, the neural network. But frankly, where I would start if I was in a firm today is just visualize your data. Just go get a data set, put it on a Tableau dashboard or a similar, you know, Microsoft product, what have you. You'll be very surprised what that tells you. Just that. Just that will immediately identify some insights, and that will drive action. Um, now, I would also say one of the things I've emphasized heavily is that the organization has to adapt to what the data is telling you, right? Um, and so you need you need executives who are going to have to who's going to assess the output from the tool, right? Who's going to escalate it to a responsible level of the manager so they can deal with it? This is some of the issues that come up in AI, right? So if I have an AI data set that's doing certain identifications and it has an error rate of 5%, is that, is that, is that sufficient, is that too, too high, what is it, right? How do you assess that risk, how do you escalate it through management? So that organizational construct, that change management equation is as important, maybe even more important than the tech itself in some respects. Great, great answer. So who's got the next question? Yeah, Travis? Hi. Um, you said something about biases, um, and I just kind of want to revisit, revisit that. Um, what data sets, or I guess how do data sets, um, uh, how do I formulate this question? How do you um, take a data set, data set and make sure that it has no biases with, uh, so that the AI isn't spewing out some type of craziness or like, Profiling somebody, or this might be one for you. I, don't know that. Um, I mean, it's a tough question, and I think it kind of comes back to what we were talking about before of the lack of standards. Um, I think there there are a lot of organizations that are trying in earnest to do that, yeah. but we're not at the point right now, and this is why the lawyers need the engineers um, to have widely accepted principles of measuring um, what the data quality is. I recently wrote a piece that the OECD published and said, you know, that this concept, we have to stop thinking about data quality in the abstract, right? Because the question is, is the data suitable for the intended purpose? Like for example, if you're studying, if you're using data to analyze some type of a medical condition in men, then it's probably fine if there aren't many or any women represented in the data set. If you're trying to use that data set to draw inferences about a broader population, then it's not okay. But we don't have widely accepted principles for measuring data, which then gets into the compliance issues because there are, you know, some companies out there try to whitewash it. Other companies out there are trying in earnest, but there are no standards and there are no rules, so maybe they do it right, maybe it doesn't work out, we don't know. But uh, you know, from my vantage point, I'm interested in your thoughts. There really are no hard and fast answers on how to solve that. It's a really interesting conversation mm -hmm. because just the word bias, yeah. what does it mean? Right? Yeah. We, 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 we participated in the business roundtable, came up with its own 10 principles of responsible AI and policy recommendations, and we worked on that committee 
I was involved in that. And we got into a big conversation about bias. And I think the ultimate, um, the ultimate work products had improper bias because all the technologists erupted on our big mass calls. They say all data is biased. It's all, it's, it, it comes from somewhere. It's, it's, got, it's got, you know, it's, it's tilted one way or another. If it's a bunch of, if, if it's, you know, based on people who are 40, it's, it's going to be fast, it's bias, right? It's based on people who are 40. So that's how we think about bias. We don't think about data as neutral. It's a collection of attributes, which we think of as bias. Well, then the lawyers are like, okay, when you say bias to me, I'm thinking about improper bias. I'm thinking about legally actionable bias that leads to, you know, unintended consequences and bad decisions, right? Based on based on that data set. So we are actually trying to have to figure out what do we even mean by bias. But avoiding bias and proper bias is incredibly important because improper bias leads to you know erroneous um, outcomes, which then can actually influence the decisions in a way that we at least we don't we don't want. Yeah. We so we're working with a with a company. This is public. We're working with a Silicon Valley startup called Prio AI, which I think their CEO um, has been a leader in, in dealing with this bias issue, right? Which is about how to have a governance platform tool that takes your policies and procedures, embeds it in the software development process, like I was talking about, but particularly focuses on bias and data sets. So that's like testing your algorithm against a curated by um, a curated data set, right? Mm -hmm. So you think I've got this algorithm, I think it's producing this result, is it okay? Well, let's go test it against another data set and see what happens. That's one way to do it. But it's not that's not a standard. That's right. frankly just a practice that we're doing kind of on our own in conjunction with another partner. What we need to do is see the scale. And, and it I think really kind of underscores the importance of having the legal and policy people work with the engineers because just just by quick show of hands how many engineers are in the room so let me ask you the question there may not be an answer because I've asked some of your um, engineering professors the question but like if somebody asks you to produce a high quality data set do you know what that means from a technical perspective I see a lot of people are, for, for the cameras people are shaking their heads no and therein lies some of the problems right because Everybody wants the same goal to make sure that the data that you're using is suitable for the purpose, which means for the intended purpose, coming back to Travis's question, it doesn't have bias in there. But again, what are you trying to do with the data? Because that informs the bias. But policymakers often use words, and I pointed this out in the article, that you want high quality data set that's error free, but the engineers don't understand what that means. And that's why we need standards and tools that bridge that gap and help us make assessments as to what is acceptable um, given the given the context in which it's being used. Okay, yeah, so it's I'm, all about I'm really curious about how we can innovate in areas like synthetic data. Because yep. one of the problems with data is it comes from like real people and it's got all this fuzz and noise and all these things in there you don't actually need for your use case. So why can't we come up with clean data sets that actually test the math and make math do what it needs to do without all these extraneous things in there that that you know push it directions that we don't fully understand. On that point, though, I would say explaining what you know and what you don't know is going to become incredibly important, right? I don't think you can oversell um, what the algo is doing. You really need to say, look, this is what it is. This is the data that it's on. Here are the attributes of the data. Here are the issues that we understand with the data, with the bias. Here's the error rate, and here's what we don't know. And maybe with that, we can get a little bit more of a transparent conversation on our so when we're talking, I mean, you see with this area of law, it's um, very uh, fluid at this point, not very precise, but there's also a lot of tensions and trade-offs. So we absolutely do want to move towards a world where we have more explainability and more transparency, but just quick show of hands, how many of you think privacy is important? How many of you think that if a company invests a lot of money, they should be able to protect their proprietary rights that our intellectual property system is important? So how do you balance the tensions between having transparency and explainability, which are very laudable goals on the one hand, but also protecting privacy and intellectual property rights, which also are laudable goals on the other. Yeah, I just mentioned synthetic data, which kind of yeah, sidesteps yeah, yeah. the privacy issue, because privacy is messy, right? Yeah. It's personally identifiable information, and if you're in Europe, it's a whole bunch, it's a whole one set of standards. If you're in the States, it's this, it's this patchwork, which is why some would argue for a national privacy law. Maybe you have, I think you have. No, I, I think <laughs> we, we do need 
to have, I mean, I think um, there's a delicate balance. We do need to have more laws to create more um, consistent standards because particularly if we want to have competition, how many people think competition is a good goal? We want to have lots of people in the marketplace so consumers have choices. I, I think competition is a good goal. Um, then we, you know, the more different regulations you layer on, like where they vary from California to Colorado to Virginia, the cost of compliance goes up. So it makes it harder for those small to medium sized businesses to break in. So this is where I think the policy makers need to step up to the plate and come up with some more normative laws, but also provide the flexibility for the standards to come in to kind of provide the guidance because the technology is going to change. And as soon as we write regulations, um, we get really nitty gritty on the technical details, it's going to become obsolete, but standards have a really important um, role because then you can reference a standard and they're, they're easier to change. So a very fun area. So who, who else has a question? Alistair? Um. The Pentagon recently released a plan for a joint all-domain command and control that aims to integrate artificial intelligence and machine learning and mobilizing all domains of the military, Air Force, Space Division, etc. And I think Northrop Grumman's involved with like mapping it. Of course, that's very futuristic technology that's not being implemented right now, although AI has been implemented in gray zone conflicts, etc. But have you or other members of the defense industry given thought to how different artificial intelligence systems, like weapon systems, can become interoperable and avoid miscommunication if there is a centralized AI system that is giving commands to everyone? Yeah, so that's the uh, JAT, called JASC2 because everything's an acronym in, in the Pentagon Joint All the Command and Control. And it is something that we, that we are very interested in in our, our chief uh, technology officer is, is particularly engaged in that process. That's what I alluded to before. I mean, I think as a company, you know, we, we span a very wide range of what the department is, is doing and what the intelligence community is doing. And from our perspective, we can absolutely see the importance of connecting all these dots, right? You just don't want to be a component supplier. You don't want to be a widget supplier. You've got to have the, Jassy 2 has been uh, also referred to as the as the Internet of all war fighting things, right? So it is, uh, you know, and it is it is um, it is a contested environment, and there is what we would call kinetic force, right? It, it is war. Um, so it is what's called the kill chain, right? It's from the gathering the information all the way to the decision being made by a commander in a contested theater. And these days, that can be Eastern Europe, that can be Pac Rim. Um, there's any number of areas where there are potential threats. Um, that can include space as, as an example. So when we look at it, we, I mean, from Northrop Grumman's perspective, we think this is incredibly important um, to be able to have this interconnectivity across the theater. That's how you're going to be able to communicate effectively. That's how you're going to be able to leverage the power of your big data sets. That's how you're going to be able to get the most out of your highly sophisticated technology. And you're going to make a decision at the end of the day or take an action at the end of the day that's consistent with what you wanted to do. It's consistent with the, with the law of war. It's consistent with the mission. It avoids unintended consequences. So while this is a difficult area, we're actually trying to make it. We're trying to you know really make it um, make it better. And but you know JATC2 is an enormous an enormous challenge. Um, take take a, take a data problem, right? The United States Department of Defense with millions of personnel and data just all over the place in all kinds of different spaces, right? So there, there, there's a heavy lift there, but I think it's, um, frankly, I think it's, there, there's, there's been something described as, a, as an arms race for emerging technology, and I think this kind of solution is part of that. And so um, all the reports that we read are just like, we have to do it, we have to do it now, we have to do it urgently. And the new National Defense Authorization Act for 23 um, appropriated a you know, significant amount of money to JATC2, so it, it is being invested. We're running short on time. Any final questions from you? Go ahead. Uh, since we have so many things that we do not understand about AI at this far point, uh, I'm a bit uncertain if we should try to regulate it now or maybe try to understand it a bit more, uh, like the standards that can be applied and pass a law uh, probably a bit later. Because even if we have a regulation now for the from the EU, for example, it might need to be amended a couple of times. So it's 
You want to take them or you want me to go? I think he's from Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Singapore approach, is let, let industry regulate itself and kind of let it play. I mean, I'm not criticizing it. It's a, they've, they've done some really, really thoughtful work in Singapore, particularly on the legal issues. Um, but that is more let it play out, let the market develop, let's see what happens, and then, and then regulate. EU went down and threw down the, a, a, you know, the AI Act and these liability directives a little bit in a vacuum. Um, just, just, and now there are 3,000 plus proposed amendments to the AI Act. Uh, I don't know where that ends up. I, I, I have to say, I would have, you know, you know, we need to have dialogue about how that's going to really work in the market effectively. I mean, I think there are a lot of, my, just my personal opinion, I mean, there's a lot of questions on how to regulate this, and we, we need to have, I think it, it ties into what Carl was just talking about, um, with the Jazzy too, but more broadly, we need interoperability, so, you know, technology that works in Europe should be able to work in, in the United States, and I think there's just a lot of unanswered questions on what the best approach is. You know, the EU AI Act is a horizontal act, as Carl said, it breaks it up into four categories based on risk level, and you know, if you're high-risk AI, whether you're an educational tool or a medical device, you're subject to the same types of regulations with this pre-conformity assessment requirement that they don't have standards for yet. Um, I think in the U.S., we're much more of a deregulatory approach and much more sector-specific. Um, but I think there just needs to be more communications about this and then thinking about you know, where can we come up with tools and maybe come up with some laws, some guidelines that could be generally applicable but still give each industry the opportunity to evolve. And I'm, I'm personally a big fan of standards um, because I think they provide a lot of, of clarity in the, in the operation but also are much more nimble in terms of updating. Any other final questions? Well, I'll ask one last question then we'll wrap up. So we have students here um, who are at the beginning of their careers as somebody who's had you know, a tremendously successful career in industry and in private practice, any final words of career advice for our students? Um, well, I, I would just say be open to opportunities. Um, you know, those of us who do the compliance work, we didn't start off in compliance. We came from all different places, right? There are lawyers, there are non-lawyers, there are technologists, there's auditors. Um, there's, there, there are quite a few lawyers given the major, nature of the space. and. Um, you know, over my career, I mean, I was at IBM for many years too, is every, every three or four years, there was an opportunity to essentially reinvent yourself if that's what you wanted to do. Now, some people will be perfectly fine being a government contract lawyer for 30 years. That's, that's, that's completely honorable. But if you're looking for ways to expand your horizons, this space has got tremendous opportunity. I mean, how are we looking at risk? How are we looking at managing decisions? How are we looking at human behavior? How are we looking at organizational dynamics? How are you doing that within whatever institution you're in, whether it's a government institution, whether it's a company, or whether you're offering advice from a law firm? Um, I think this is about as exciting time as I've ever seen. And if you like, if you're curious, you want to new, new, learn something new every day, if you want to get into decisions that really matter and impact the daily lives of people, um, you know, compliance is, you gotta, you know, it's not a great word from a branding perspective, but the reality <laughs> of it is, um, it's a lot of fun. And, and again, I think the importance of Carl's position, I mean, it reports directly into the CEO, so these are things that... Um, general counsel, actually. General, general counsel. <laughs> but, and, and the board committee, um, the boards pay attention to um, compliance, so it really is an important area, and I think for the students here, um, you know, Duke just offers a wealth of classes on these types of issues across different schools, in the law school, the Sanford Public Policy School, Pratt, and through the great efforts of the Science and Society team, you know, trying to bridge all the different schools together. So if these are issues that interest you, I would just encourage you to take advantage of all that Duke has to offer. So finally, um, Carl, we are so grateful for you coming down to Durham and sharing your thoughts and insights um, with us. I mean, you really are one of the thought leaders in this area, and this, this important topics. And, um, just incredibly grateful for uh, the time that we've had. It went by really quickly. And um, I hope all of you can join me in thanking Carl.